So, um, <coughs> like I said, just a couple of pieces of information here. Um, this is going to be an online portfolio submission. Um, so uh, the um, if you, uh, you know, search for UCF Studio Art Portfolio, you should be able to find that web page. Um, there is not an active link yet. It will be posted when uh, the submission period actually opens up, and we'll get into the dates in just a second. All of your images do have to be submitted at the time that you are uh, opening up that application. So what we really strongly recommend is to go ahead and take a look at, uh, there's a section, how should I... Uh, prepare my portfolio, something like that. Um, it gives you uh, the information for how you need to label all of your files. You want to make sure you're organized, you have everything ready to go before you click the button to go ahead and submit. You only have one opportunity. There can only be one submission associated with your account information. So if you start to set it up and then you realize you forgot something, you're not going to be able to add additional pieces later. Okay. Alrighty, um, so the uh, important dates here, this is going to open up next Monday. Um, usually it's pretty early in the morning, but you know, if it's 730 and it's not open yet, don't panic. Um, it should open, uh, you know, usually a little after eight or so. Um, and then the submission period will be open through Thursday, March 17th. Important thing here is at 5 p.m. So it's not an 11.59 p.m. situation. Someone is cutting that off at 5 p.m. The best recommendation that we can give to you is to please try to submit before that final date. Um, there's many times where students will have some kind of technical issue or their network is failing. Um, and if it's past that date, we cannot guarantee that your portfolio will be able to be reviewed in this semester. So if you're having any issues, you can always follow up um, with SFED advising. We can try to help troubleshoot that with you. Um, but like I said, if it's past the deadline, there's not really anything that we can do, okay? So it's really important to be within those dates. Your results will be emailed to you from svetadvising at ucf.edu by 5 p.m. on Friday, March 25th. So that is when you should expect to have your results. If it is before then, then we cannot provide you any information about your results. It's possible we may have results earlier that date, but it's not a guarantee. So just to keep that in mind as you are making plans moving forward, if you're planning to seek an advising appointment, these are you know, rel relevant uh, pieces of information in the event that you know, you're wanting to have an appointment based on your portfolio results. The results will be emailed to the email address that you enter in your registration. This is going to sound um, really obvious, but please double, triple check the uh, spelling of your email address. There's many times where students accidentally misspell uh, the email address that they're submitting, particularly that knights.ucf.edu portion. Um, if the email is not entered correctly, it's very difficult to find you, um, and in some cases we cannot reach the student. So very critical that you have that, uh, you know, every all of your contact information is listed correctly. And then the requirements here. So um, this portfolio uh, is relevant for a number of groups. So uh, this is going to be required if you are doing the Art BA Studio Track. It's also required for the Studio Art BFA. It's also required for the Art Studio Minor. Um, now, if you are interested in pursuing experimental animation, hopefully you've gone to other information sessions and so you're clear on this, but the Studio Art Portfolio is only an option for admission to experimental animation if your catalog year is summer 2021 or prior. Um, if you have any uncertainty about um, where you stand with this, if you would be eligible to submit the Studio Art Portfolio for admission to Experimental Animation Track, please send an email to svetadvising at ucf.edu. We can help clear that up for you right away. Okay. The prerequisites here, um, there's going to be these six courses that are listed. Um, the enforcement, though, is going to differ a little bit based on the courses. So the four studio courses, your 2D, 3D design, drawing one and drawing two, as of this semester, all of those courses must be already completed in a prior term with a grade of C or better in order to be eligible to submit in spring of 2022. So if you are currently enrolled in something like drawing two, you're not eligible to submit at this time. 
Um, there are also uh, Art History 1 and 2. Those are mandatory prerequisites as well. However, if you are enrolled in one or both of those in this current semester, you are still eligible to submit because those don't influence the works that you're producing for your portfolio. So once again, if you have any questions about your prerequisite eligibility, that is a really excellent question for advising. Um, and if you are uh, a future UCF student, if you're planning to transfer to UCF and you're not currently enrolled here, uh, we do need you to include an unofficial transcript in the application. If you are a current UCF student, just make sure that your UCF ID is listed correctly and we'll be able to access your information. Um, and then finally, if you have any questions, I would just recommend, you know, take a picture of this uh, if you don't have these details already. The first link there is going to be uh, for the Studio Art Portfolio website. Um, if you have specific questions about the design requirements, you're welcome to contact Ashley Taylor at that email address. For the uh, drawing portion, you can contact Teresa Lucy at that email address. Um, for general studio art portfolio questions, there's the studio art portfolio email. And then anything relating to advising, really in advising, what we can help with more are the logistical pieces. Um, so it's not going to be, uh, you know, am I formatting this piece correctly? Those kinds of things. That's going to be better for the faculty. Okay, um, but that's everything I have. So I'm going to pass it over to our wonderful faculty members. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, visible, yes? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Teresa Lucy. I am an instructor lecturer for the drawing department. I'm going to go over the specifics of the visual requirements for the drawing portion of your studio art portfolio. Um, okay, so you will need to submit five drawings from either drawing one or drawing two or any approved equivalent course. Two to three of the works must be figurative, meaning it must contain the human figure that could be a drawing of the live model or it could be a skeleton contour drawing. We'll get over uh, the specifics of that in a second. Students are asked to select drawing works that showcase their abilities and use of formal elements and principles, measure and proportion, structure, line quality, contour and contrast, volume, one and two point perspective, value, and the figure from life drawing. This is real quick. For this review, drawing is defined as work done in traditional physical media, so not digital drawings, no digital art. Uh, so it has to be physically on paper. All works must be created from observation, not from photography. We'll get into the visual examples of that. So this would be a drawing that would typically come out of our program. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about these elements of design. Um, this contains value, even though it's just flat graphic shapes. The line quality is something that you would see in more of like a tattoo kind of language. There's not a lot of sketching. Uh, we look to make sure that you guys aren't having these back and forth hand movements, that you're really sinking that charcoal into the page. Uh, your line quality is clear. Volume, it describes depth, proportion, the human figure in there, the skeleton on the side is in proportion. We're looking at uh, comparing the size of the skull to the size of the pelvis or the size of the rib cage, stuff like that. It's in perspective. We're going to get into the specifics of perspective uh, a little later on uh, and structure. Here's another example. This is a more simple example. This is a wonderful drawing, even though it doesn't have all of that tone and composition. This would also be an example of something that would pass the portfolio review. It's got very clear contour line quality. The volume and perspective is very clear as well. There are no horizontal lines within this drawing because it's at a three quarter view. So we're looking to see if you notice that when you can see more than one side to a box, more than one side to a cube, that there's no horizontal information. We're looking at verticals and diagonals when you can see more than one side to that cube. If you can envision this cow skull within a cube, um, you can see that 
the composition is diagonal and vertical. So we're looking for that uh, structure and line quality as well. Here's another example of something that would pass as figurative art. Um, we're looking at process. We're looking at you utilizing uh, the different forms of mark making, straight line inspection, contour, gesture, tone or accidental tone as we talk about in the drawing classrooms. Just a wonderful example of just clear contour. Another simple example of contour line, um, this showcases proportion, right? We're gonna compare the size of that skull to the size of the rib cage to the size of the pelvis. It has a graphic design element. They're bringing in that red pencil for visual interest. Uh, there's process. You can see where they've measured out in their red pencil, trying to find um, the high point in relationship to the low point in relationship to the leftmost point and the rightmost point of this object before they kind of came in and started carving out the form. We're looking for you guys to show that you're asking visual questions with your pencil before you just come in and try to finish it or cartoon it in. This would be another example of something figurative. So you could do a portrait. Um, you can see these process lines asking questions about, am I skipping equal, equal distances as I build uh, the structure of this head? Um, when we look at the portraits, we're looking for someone who is more concerned with building a head instead of drawing a face. We're looking for the difference between illustration, drawing a face and life drawing, building a head. So process. We're looking for you to draw like an architect when you um, describe atmospheric perspective or perspective in general, one or two point perspective. You can see um, a clear example of diagonal and vertical information, um, building all of the structures like the mirror and that table. There's not a single horizontal line flattening out those shapes. So this would be someone that understands perspective um, and we would pass them for portfolio review. Another clear example of um, perspective, uh, we're really looking for you guys not to put in this flat horizontal information. That's the number one thing that I think will kind of zap um, your portfolio. Uh, so even when you're drawing something like the skull, this would be um, an example of somebody who has a clear understanding of perspective. And this would also count as a figure drawing as well. Simple um, self-portrait skull and bag drawings that we do a lot in um, drawing two especially would be a great thing to include in your portfolio. Line quality, very clear contour line, no sketching. This would also count as figurative. Um, so just containing the skeleton. The line quality, and this also adds um, an understanding of composition, right? They're not placing everything dead center on the page. Um, they're creating like a, a one frame film uh, with visual interest. You can see a clear understanding of perspective in the ladder, how each one of those rungs of the ladder is pointing to the same vanishing point. So every single angle of each rung is slightly different. So this would be somebody that it's clear that they understand perspective. Another clear example of just a simple contour drawing of a skeleton. Um, we're looking for a certain amount of intensity, right? And I think drawing the spine, drawing the rib cage uh, for most people is their kind of ticket into um, showing us that intensity. So if you have any clear drawings of the skeleton, th those might be your best bet. Another example, and this would also be an example of value. So you don't have to come in and shade everything. Um, simple flat graphic shapes uh, for visual interest and composition would also count as value. Here's another example of uh, drawing two students self-portrait series. So you can include something like this. These are a little different. They don't show as much process, but this person has a clear understanding of um, proportion and line quality. Gestures as well. Um, gestures are a little difficult to include into the portfolio review because 
maybe only one out of every 10 gestures you do is gonna be any good because they're so quick. But if you do have one, maybe a longer pose, uh, eight minute, 10 minute gesture that you kind of got to carve into a little bit more, that would be a good example of uh, a figurative element to include into your portfolio. Another clear example of just the positive and negative space, shape awareness, um, line quality, value. Another example of our bag self-portrait um, uh, issue that we work through mostly in drawing too, be a great example for your figurative element. We're looking for you describing not just the nameable parts of the face, not the iconographic parts of the face, but the actual planal structure of the skin. So finding unnameable shapes rather than drawing parts is something we would also look for. So if you're only drawing eyes, nose, mouth, ear, right, um, when you get to the figure, you won't have a chance of passing portfolio review. We're looking for someone to overemphasize the actual volume um, and uh, intricate forms of the unnameable parts of the face or the less nameable parts of the face. So I wanted to include uh, three examples of work that would typically come from outside of our university. So our drawing program is pretty specific um, and intense and competitive. And the work coming uh, from transfer students might be a little bit more tonal and photographic, but um, I've included, I believe there's three examples of work that may come from outside of the university that we would still um, uh, pass for the drawing portion. So even though this isn't um, showing that contour line or anything, there's a certain amount of shape recognition and sensitivity in this that I would trust that this student would be able to move on to upper level courses, uh, intermediate drawing or advanced drawing, and they'd be able to catch up um, pretty quickly in our program. This is another example. Um, the line quality isn't quite up to snuff when it comes to uh, all of the slides uh, that we showed coming from inside of our program, but they do have an understanding of perspective. There are no horizontals in that box that you can see more than one side of. It's only built of diagonals and verticals. And there's a certain amount of shape recognition, balance, composition that I think this person with a little bit of instruction at UCF could improve quickly. And this would be um, probably an A student coming from um, another university outside of UCF a very clear example of tone, um, protecting your highest highlights, uh, finding your darkest darks and your midtones, not letting it all bleed together. There's a sensitivity, there's line quality, there's balance. So those would be um, some examples of work that might come from outside of our very specific drawing program. That will end my portion on drawing. I'm going to pass it off to Professor Ashley Taylor and I will stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you, Teresa, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And can you all see that? And can you see the window change too? A little cropped. Let's see. That's better. Okay. But it's not, if I do it this way, it's not working. It doesn't just show the screen, it does show um, uh, uh, the PDF. Um, I think if you do Control L, it'll full screen. Yeah, that's what I have it at, so it's weird. Hmm. How about now? Nothing? If you scroll down a little bit, I think we can see the full thing. Nothing? I think it's visible. Okay. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. All right. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Taylor. I am a lecturer of design and printmaking here at the University of Central Florida. I'm gonna be going over the design portion. So uh, keep in mind, we have design 2D and design 3D when looking at these slides. 
So for the first part is you are going to need three 2D works from ART 2201C design fundamentals or any approved equivalent courses. Those um, projects that you submit should demonstrate the formal elements and principles of design, those including uh, line, shape, value, um, and then in the principles, the use of those elements, right? So implied space, color theory, balance, contrast, dominance, harmony, proportion, repetition, scale, unity, and variety, which I'll go over in just a second. In this design 2D portfolio, you must have at least one piece that demonstrates color theory. So it cannot just be all shape or line or black and white. It has to demonstrate a use of value and the use of color interaction. For the design 3D um, portion, you're going to use three photographs of works from your ART 2203C Design Fundamentals 3D or approved equivalent courses. You are to also include work. This is now three-dimensional work, right? So it should showcase line, shape, value, those same elements, but in the three-dimensional space. Now we're considering things like weight, volume, scale, um, form, time, uh, three-dimensionality, volume, and um, viewing something from all sides. Your work should be photographed on a seamless color neutral background and lighted in a way that must clearly represent the work. Do not use crumbled materials or anything that's distracting from the actual work itself. It should be presented like museum quality work. The image should represent the entire work. Do not crop the edges um, and sh everything should fit right inside nicely framed. You are encouraged to combine multiple views of the same 3D sculptures into one image to showcase the work. Ashley, I think your slides aren't being shown right now. Ah. PDFs. Can you see yeah. it now at least? All right. There you okay. Go. So I'm just going to go right into to design. So summary of those of phot photographing, make sure your photographs are nicely presented. Do not have any background elements. Do not have anything seen from like chairs or beds or anything. It should be cropped to the edges. So here's some examples of two dimensional work. So in your two dimensional work, you should be demonstrating those elements of design. So line, form, um, shape, things like that. But then you should also be demonstrating how you're using those elements. So what is the balance of the composition looking like? How are you using proportion? Um, is there elements of repetition to encourage value? And also you should be considering scale and unity and variety, which I'll go over in a little bit more with some pieces. So this example here utilizes line quite a bit. It uses, utilizes repetition to create value and allows for the eye to move around the peaks. Composition is also encouraged as well as the use of diagonals. So you can see here diagonals help the eye move around the piece and keep the viewer inside. Another example here is the use of both diagonals and also a clear focal point. So in design, remember this is not drawing. So in the drawing portion, you are demonstrating realistic approaches to demonstrating form. But in design, you're actually utilizing decision-making in order to create clear and um, successful compositions for viewing. So all of your imagery should not be confusing to the viewer. It should have clear intention and should be easy to see. So as you can see in this piece, there's a clear focal point, the use of the repetition and scale. So things that recede, right? The use of perspective, the things that recede get smaller and those lines get thinner. So there's a lot of clear intention with this piece here, as well as here. Now we're starting to see line, line variety. So line variety here is allowing for nice value shifts and focus on certain parts of the image. Another example of unity and variety. So the unity here is 
having very consistent line qualities, but then having variety of them to encourage a nice, pleasant image that's easy to see. Um, it, it helps your eye move around. It just feels like a complete image. Here's another example. So these ones you might've had in 2D design, right? Where you, these were used with tape, but you might've had this assignment where you're actually doing more of a stippling technique here. So this one, uh, we're not so much looking at the drawing of it. We're looking at the arrangement of how you used value and how you created your composition. So it's not so much about the drawing ability. It's more about how value how the full use of a range of value um, creates a harmonious picture plane. Here's another example, a, a better example of a full range of value, um, creating a focal point and allowing for a complete image. Another example here, we're seeing uh, a continuous use of value, an attention to detail, and an attention to craftsmanship too. Craftsman, craftsmanship, excuse me, is a big part of design, right? Where we show that we respect the materials we're using and we respect how it's presented. Also notice how everything is presented well. So the photographs are, are really successful. There's no shadowing, there's no lighting issues. They're all easy to see. So we navigate into shape and texture um, still with an emphasis on value, but a slightly different value. Notice how if you like blur your eyes here, you can see that full range of values showing. And um, so the combination of texture and value is very successful with this piece. Uh, sometimes with texture, you can get really, you can fall in love with having a lot of texture, but then the value range starts to diminish, right? They start to look consistent. But here we're starting, we see an effective contrasted figure from the background. And it's, it's very, it's a very dynamic piece. That continues to be seen here. We're starting to see a lot of high key values as well as low key, but we're also able to understand what's going on and to demonstrate texture and value really well. Here, another example of a great value, simple symmetrical form here. But again, it's all about being able to demonstrate both uh, shape, value, composition, and craftsmanship. Notice the balance and consistency of the whole image here as well as the harmony of the shapes together. So they're very consistent. Notice the, um, the shapes, as you get to detail, they get smaller and more focused, but as you get more broader outside of the face, they get bigger. And that's kind of this unity and variety happening here. You're encouraged to submit a shape or a line um, that demonstrates both harmony using maybe some gestalt principles. So um, the idea of things overlapping, creating other imagery, negative positive relationships, uh, closure. So the idea of not having to fully illustrate something by using shapes and the ability to our eye to connect those lines and create more imagery. Um, convergent lines, even directional forces. So much like in the drawing where diagonals are encouraged to portray space, diagonals are actually encouraged in design to move the eye around and make a very dynamic piece. So if you have a lot of horizontals and verticals um, in, your draw, in your designs, excuse me, they tend to be more still, more static. But as you can see here, a lot of the use of diagonals here makes a very dynamic and interesting piece. Same thing can be said here. Notice we're seeing a lot of negative positive reversal and it's starting to actually tell a story. There's a sense of time happening here um, and the use of symbol. So in some of your assignments, you might've been asked to use symbols and that's completely fine. Um, that's, that's appropriate here, but the real um, successful part of this piece is the ability to understand what's going on. In all the chaos, there is 
a sense of harmony through that unity and variety, a variety of shapes, a variety of, of black and white, a lot going on. But through the use of the rule of thirds, let's bring back the rule of thirds, right? And the use of negative space and positive space, we can actually see what's going on. Another example here, same thing, negative positive reversal, um, very intense scene, but again, it's very easily understood what's going on through the use of shape, negative space, and positive space. Here's another example that uses line and shape together. So when lines get thicker, they end up being these really broad, huge or larger shapes that allow for the eye to rest. And so even through the repetition of line, we do have these nice mental pauses for us to appreciate the form that's being presented in front of us. Here's another example of a negative positive reversal, not as intense as the other scenes, but it utilizes symmetry really well in order for us to understand what's going on. We're also starting to see even a light source here. So the light source at the right creates these beautiful, really consistent shadows. Another example, again, too, of an intense scene, but again, a clear focal point. I cannot tell you, I cannot emphasize enough, the, the clarity of the focal point is really important to these works. If you don't have a clear focal point, they're not going to do well. Another example of a symmetrical uh, along the horizon, horizon, excuse me, here, and then a slight negative positive reversal demonstrates these design principles. Type can be used too. Um, these were in 2D design. So uh, in these, we're talking about the same issues of negative positive reversal, but now we're including legibility and readability of type in those. And so this utilizes the same idea of those Gestalt principles, um, including negative positive reversal or um, figure ground but as well now we're starting to look at the shape of text and having it um, be controlled through movement. In some of these, so this is a texture, this is a major demonstration of texture and value. So through the use of texture, you can activate the surface of the picture plane, but it's also encouraged you consider how those textures interact to create a holistic picture plane. So even though this has a lot of texture, you can still understand what's going on. You can still see the picture and it reads entirely. The whole uh, reads as an image. Here's another example of a scale. Now we're starting to see scale shifts. So major emphasis placed on the basketball, the shoes, but as this picture recedes, we start to see some of the background elements. But those background elements are abstracted in a way that they aren't as realistic. So they're not as clashing with the foreground elements. So we're actually seeing a lot of space here too. Another example too of a scale shift here in the use of texture. Notice the when you blur your eyes, you're getting a whole value range. And that's really important here. You, you wanna have, a full range of value in these imagery. Another example, and I think the last example of our texture exercises. So one of your pieces should demonstrate both value and color theory here. So as you could see here in this painting, we're now starting to explore color relationships and color harmony with the use of the three properties of color. So hue, value, and saturation. You might've done this in your 2D class where you had to include your color wheel, your, your color relationships, and then the final piece itself. That is totally acceptable. Please showcase that. We, you know, the biggest thing we see a lot is um, students not submitting works that demonstrate color relationships and color harmony they might send in work that is just like, I really love the colors. And it's like, no, it's all about intention and use of color relationships that we need to see. So please submit those color exercises. That's, you know, they might not be the best thing you did, but they are the best demonstration of interaction of color. So here we're starting to see those color relationships on display, right? We're seeing the monochromatic 
next to the analogous, right? And then the complementary, and then the tertiary colors. And you might have had different color relationships where you had to include, it might have been maybe more split complementary. Um, but again, please include the interactions of different color schemes. This one, so this is an example of utilizing like complementary colors as well as analogous colors and the relationships to each other in kind of a Joseph Albers-esque uh, arrangement. So those are also encouraged here as well as here. This is like, I think we call this the Chuck Close assignment. <laughs> Another example here. So it's not so much, so you notice it's not about the drawing, it's about the color interaction. Keep that in mind. Another example of a monochromatic next to a complementary scheme and analogous and triadic. You can showcase the color. It's in, it's, I advised you to showcase your color wheel next to the painting itself. Um, to showcase you know, that study and that understanding of the color schemes. This is like another exercise. So you might've had this one where it was splitting up the image into four parts, or you might've been asked to do four different versions of an image. Those are both strong candidates for your color theory. Another example here. The hard part about this is going to be photographing your work effectively. So um, if you were asked to demonstrate your work on a very large board, it's advisable to photograph each piece and then rearrange it into your um, page if you need to. Remember, it's all about the interaction of color and not so much about the um, strength of detail in your painting. Keep in mind with color, it's, it's also important to consider value, right? So value range. Value range encourages um, a harmonious picture plane. So again, do not, do not forget about the value aspect. And now we'll go into 3D design. So in 3D design, you have very specific things that you should include. And that should include the representational abstraction and non-representational pieces that you first did um, or, or your very first assignments. So that representational piece should really demonstrate a realistic look um, as well as an attention to detail and craftsmanship. As you can see here, we're seeing elements in the three-dimensional space that we're also seeing in the two-dimensional space. So we're seeing shape, we're seeing line, we're seeing composition, we're seeing diagonals, um, especially the way that this was photographed. Notice it was photographed on a three-quarter view to give us a better sense. If this was photographed straightforward, it wouldn't be as strong as and dynamic as it is right here. Notice the neutral background as well. There's no distracting elements. Everything is working fine. You, you're, you're able to see what's going on and there's enough contrast. If you have a, uh, say you have a very bright image, you can include a, a black background, but I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of this arrangement so you can actually see the volume. Sometimes a black background can really um, flatten out a piece. But so in this work, we're starting to see elements of repetition at play, uh, composition, even contrast, as well as how light is hitting it. So the beautiful part of this form is the shadowing that's occurring, how light is hitting it, and it's showing that repetition. So consider how light hits your object, consider how the light source affects that object, including its shadow. Another example here, very clean, nicely presented repetition. The use of shape now comes in as well as symmetry. So on the side of that, we're starting to see an attention to detail, a little bit more sophistication with how the shape is built. You're, you should have an example of your representational, your abstract, and your non-representational. And, and you should be demonstrating a proficiency and understanding of the differences between all three. Notice here, we see an, uh, 
the more realistic subject matter, um, then it's been abstracted, right? It's been changed. We still understand what it looks like, but now we're starting to see some inventiveness coming in. And then lastly, we're seeing an object that's capturing the essence of it, right? It's capturing the curves, it's capturing even the weight. Um, but now it's changed completely. It's not representing that object at all, but we're seeing how those elements transfer. Here's another great example. So uh, we have the representational piece on the left, nicely presented, beautifully uh, arranged, has a lot of great detail, form, um, even it has this element of transparency that's quite beautiful. And then we start to navigate into the abstract where they're now pulling apart those pieces. We're still getting an element of the clock, We're still under an understanding there's an element of this kind of time clock piece but now it's changed, it's showing your inventiveness. And then now we're getting into the non-representational where the piece has been deconstructed and reassembled to create a unique and interesting um, form. Some of these pieces, you, so depending on the class, you might've had very specific things you had to create or, or less specific but it's really important that you showcase the difference between the representational, the abstract and the non-representational. And here um, we're seeing a very unique take on a form. Uh, we're seeing even the use of graphic shapes, symbols um, to show the personality of the form itself. And that's okay, that's completely encouraged. Just keep in mind um, that you should be considering how those objects are arranged on the form and how the intentional use of their arrangement. And that is it for the 3D design portion of my presentation. So now I think we're going to accept questions from the audience. Okay, cool. So yeah, if, uh, if you guys want, I can go ahead and feed the questions along. So um, the first one, I think you guys mostly addressed if the person wanted to, um, you know, ask more detailed questions, but they're saying, what should we use and which artwork should we include for the portfolio? So I think that's what we just did here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then we have... Someone's asking, if we began at UCF last school year, we can't apply to studio portfolio for experimental animation. Um, Catherine, it all depends on your uh, specific catalog year. Um, so if it was, you know, it depends on the actual semester. So I would recommend go ahead and follow up with us with an email and we can let you know if you're eligible to submit this portfolio for that purpose. It's not to say, you know, even if you're not eligible to submit it for experimental, it's sometimes still a good idea to have it as an option. Um, and we can discuss that with you as well. Um, looks like the next one is also, I guess the first couple were advising related. Um, the next person is asking, I would need to finish 2D fundamentals before the portfolio. Yes, so you do have to have 2D design, 3D design, drawing one and drawing two all completed with a grade of C or better prior to the semester that you submit the studio art portfolio. Um, so if uh, anyone who's here, uh, if you find yourself not eligible at this time, there will be another studio art portfolio in the fall. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't be classes you can enroll in for the fall. That's something we can address with you in advising if you'd like. Um, okay, uh, this question is asking which cameras are recommended for the pictures of our art pieces? I can take that one. So um, I, <clears throat> if you have a decent phone, you can use your phone. Um, it's, it's the most accessible thing that you can use. Um, I, it's all going to be about lighting lighting and how you um, set up your picture. So it's it's advisable for me. So natural light, three o'clock, four o'clock, take it outside, put it on the wall and use your natural light. It's the easiest way to work now. But if you really wanna start taking the, photo, uh, the photography seriously, you can actually borrow uh, a camera from the UCF library. If you're on main campus, they have SLR cameras that you can actually check out, which is really neat. So you can, um, yeah, you can use a camera from the library and they even have training on it too. So you can actually download 
the web course and they'll show you how to use it. Now, obviously this is more timely. So, uh, you know, portfolio is due in a couple of weeks. So, but um, do not take advantage of, or do not uh, let the photography part be uh, a last minute thing. Take advantage of the tools and really make sure your, your photographs look good. And you can do it. I photograph my work with my phone a lot, you know, for last minute. So you can really do it well. And there are a lot of great tutorials online that show you how to photograph your work. But also if you're ever having issues, you can reach out to me as well uh, via email if you do have some photography issues. I kind of want to add on to this a little bit. Um, when you guys are photographing your drawings, I've seen in the past, sometimes people try to compensate for some lighting issues by taking it into Photoshop or a photo editor and pumping up the contrast and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, you're really going to lose all of your process lines um, if you make the uh, image a little too bright or pump the contrast up too much. Um, you don't want it to read as just like lights and darks. Uh, a more subtle uh, approach is going to protect the strongest parts of your drawing, those um, process lines. So make sure not to uh, um, hike it all the way up and, and lose all of the detail. All right, Emily is asking, what advice would you have for someone who completed 2D and 3D design as an AP credit in high school? Looking at the slide examples, my assignments were not the same as the ones at UCF. That was design specifically? That was, uh, yeah, pertaining to 2D and 3D, although I'm sure general answers for both would be helpful. Right. Um, if, yeah, go ahead, Ash. Oh. Um, I advise you to uh, get with me and show me your portfolio and I can give you some help on that. And, and so showing your showing faculty your portfolio is the first stage so we can get on the same page and then we can understand like, OK, you know what you can work on um, still apply, still apply to the portfolio. Uh, with what you have, but at least sh start showing that work to faculty now and get some feedback on it so that we can help you prepare more for it since you haven't had those classes here at UCF. And I'll just add, um, if you've taken classes outside of this university and you're applying with work outside of this university, the elements of design, whether it be in drawing or in design itself, would be the thing to showcase. So even though it might not be the exact project or the exact problem, if you can still show the same design elements or visual elements, then we will understand that you understand. Um, yes. Okay, Ren is asking, can I submit work from the intensive classes? So if uh, you, if you, yeah, um, absolutely. Now, if you've passed that intense and advise me, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but if you've passed that portion of the of the intensive, whichever intensive course you have, you shouldn't necessarily you should still apply, but you should have are you should be okay for yeah, people. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can address that because that's a question we get a lot, you know, because and for anyone who's not aware, I'm just going to give this super brief, uh, you know, if you submit portfolio and you don't pass, let's say the drawing area, there's a course called drawing intensive you can take, pass it with a C or better that then counts as passing that portion of portfolio. Um, what is not uh, permitted would be to take an intensive course and then not need to submit that portion of portfolio. So students are still required to submit portfolio, but if you've previously completed, let's say drawing intensive, and then you're submitting portfolio, that essentially is your insurance policy. You are still required to submit a proper, uh, you know, submission, but if you don't then pass the, the portfolio uh, with those works, as long as you have that previous passing grade, you're still good for portfolio. Um, hopefully that kind of clears that. Um, definitely if anyone wants more clarification on that, come to advising because you know, we're, we're always happy to, to clarify that. Um, Taylor is asking, will there be a place for a description of each piece? A verbal description within the portfolio? 
Um, I think the they might be asking like when they're literally submitting it, is there going to be like a spot to type in a description or something like that? My understanding is that they're supposed to label the files themselves. Is that? Yes, I would assume. Um, I, in grading them, I haven't seen comments from the students, but maybe just a, a file name, something like that. But it should be visual communication is my understanding that, that if if you have to explain it uh and we're not seeing it there's a problem um okay so this one uh seems a little uh kind of referential to a previous question but someone's asking if i took ap art in high school and gained credit for 2d design through that what kinds of pieces should i submit I would um, I would submit the works that demonstrate those elements and principles of design. So that's that's how we judge here. So the elements being line, shape, value, color, right, needs to demonstrate those elements, um, texture, uh, and how you use them. So they should be your most successful pieces. Luckily, it's only three for for two D design. So. It gives you a chance to really showcase, but make sure there are um, formal principles of design being explored in those works and that they're not drawing. A lot of people confuse the drawing with design, right? So it should demonstrate compositional strategies that achieve successful arrangement that yield a, you know, a consistent viewing and, you know, a focal point. Um, there's two questions uh, basically asking the same thing. Uh, they're saying they didn't get assigned representational abstract and non-representational artwork assignments. So they want to know what to do. Gotcha. So um, go ahead, submit still those forms that have, that demonstrate volume, demonstrate how lighting hits it, um, showcases how you are thinking about the three-dimensional space. Um, absolutely, that is fine. Um, Ingrid wants to know regarding 2D works, can or does traditional photography count for one piece? So can photography count for 2D? Right. Um, as long as it's demonstrating a use and understanding of value. So your photography should be including composition value, right? Again, uh, and again, if you're not sure, feel free to reach out and ask me, you know, because photography can have a lot of things to it. Um, but just make sure it's demonstrating those elements. Um, Genesis is asking, I've already taken all the required classes in community college. I'm transferring in the fall. I would like to take intensive classes because my artwork slash skills aren't like the examples. Is this okay? Um, I can kind of give from an advising perspective and then, you know, if you guys have input as well. Um, there's really no disadvantage to submitting this portfolio. You can always submit again later. You can always take the intensives later if you don't end up passing. But if you've already met the prerequisites, it's usually a good idea to submit at that earliest opportunity anyway, even if you're not 100% confident, just to get a sense of where you stand, just so we have a better idea of um, what your best moves are going forward. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, there's no harm in applying if you are able to, but if you don't make it, not the end of the world. We have courses that'll catch you up real quick. Yep. Or, I mean, you know, it's also uh, possible to resubmit. So sometimes students don't want to take those courses, but they, you know, feel like they can do additional um, stuff on their own. So both are good options. Um, Emily says, I completed the prerequisites for studio art, but at a different college, so the quality may not be up to UCF standards. How do you view this? Do you consider that in your review? Um, so uh, in my last three slides, I showed some examples of work that isn't quite up to um, the standards when it comes to showing process and line quality. Um, but if everything else is working for you, we have to weigh whether or not you'll be successful or ready for the upper level drawing courses. So if we feel like um, you're successful in every other area <laughs> and it doesn't quite look like a UCF drawing, sure, we'll give you a chance, right? But if you do not have an understanding of perspective, if you do not have an understanding of composition, if you don't have 
an understanding of proportion, it's better for you, um, uh, someone who hopefully wants to get a job in this field one day to go through drawing one and drawing two again or intensive uh, so that you have the actual skills that you want from a university experience. Yeah, and I want to emphasize that on the design side too. Um, if, you know, it might not look like the slides I presented, but if you are demonstrating an interaction of color that demonstrates um, an understanding of composition and color and value that create a harmonious composition, um, then yes, we will of course accept that work. Um, I'm going to skip the next couple because uh, the next two are asking basically about community college work. So I think you guys address that. But definitely, if those students want to, you know, submit additional questions, feel free to do so. Um, okay. Uh, Paul is asking, I have a few questions for both drawing and design. I have some still live drawings in color for my drawing one class. Will those drawings be acceptable or all the drawings need to be in black and white? Um, so that was the first part. So um, it really depends on how successful it is. So uh, in drawing, we like to say steal the car a lot. So um, even though our drawing one, drawing two courses may traditionally only be in charcoal and we don't get quite into tone or color so much, if you if you come in and if you steal the car, if you don't ask permission and you submit something in color or with a, a, a tonal drawing, if you demonstrate an understanding of tone, meaning you're not using it as a decoration to hide the fact that you don't have an understanding of structure and line quality, um, and you're actually using tone as structure, as light, then yes, we'll, of course we'll take it. And if your understanding of tone translates into your understanding of color, meaning all individual unnameable shapes get their own tone and all of the individual tones get their own color, then yes, you've stolen the car, you didn't ask permission, of course, we'll let you um, submit a color drawing. If the color drawing is decorative, iconographic and unsuccessful, no, we will not accept it. Um, the second part was related to design. They say, I have different pieces for my design 3D. Is it okay if I submit different pieces to represent the representational, non-representational, and abstract? Yes, absolutely. As long as they demonstrate, you know, an understanding of how you would abstract something and effective use of like diagonals, um, curves, uh, more <laughs> dynamic form as opposed you know as long as it's a very uh, engaging piece from the round then absolutely um the next one i think i can take the start of this here uh would the portfolios be reviewed for whichever student submits it first or do you review them all after the closing point i.e is there a first come first serve or a limit to how many students are able to pass the portfolio my understanding is that there is no discrimination based on when you submit as long as you're within those uh parameters and you submit uh pieces that are of the appropriate type and able to be viewed uh, by the committee um, there is no maximum number of students who can pass this portfolio review. This is, of course, a contrast to the emerging media portfolios, if you're also looking into those, um, where they do have a specific cohort they're able to accept. This is more about meeting the specific requirements and being able to move forward, rather than a specific group being selected, if I'm... Uh, taking that correctly. Uh, and then they're asking, um, would it be recommended to do both intensive courses in the same semester or is the workload too heavy? Do you guys have insight on that? It depends. depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For me, I think uh, the workload of the intensive drawing class is not um, heavier than drawing one or drawing two. Uh, it is just a combination of drawing one and drawing two. So um, the way I've taught intensive and the way I've seen a few other uh, of the drawing faculty teach intensive will take maybe the first two to four weeks uh, to recap drawing one concepts. So drawing in perspective, um, drawing boxes, vanishing points, um, 
horizontals, verticals, diagonals, things like that. And then we'll utilize the rest of the 16 weeks to catch you up on the figure um, so that you have a solid foundation for taking the intermediate drawing course, which is traditionally an anatomy course. Um, so we need you to get an understanding of the figure before then. Um, so the workload is not more intensive. It's just that you're taking the time to revisit these concepts. And from the design point, um, I know it's been, it's uh, each faculty teaches it slightly different, but um, I know that in some design intensive courses that it actually, some faculty have you revisiting some of those projects and like working on them to improve them. Um, when I teach design intensive, I tend to, go just like in the drawing intensive I go over a lot of the foundational elements that might have been missed as like a catch up um, but then we might do new projects so it, it really depends upon the semester you're doing it and the rest of your courses too um, yeah <laughs> okay uh, Lily asks could I have more clarification on the organization of the files how do we submit So um, the the link that will be available, um, uh, perhaps advising would have uh, more information on the exact date that that would drop. When it, when is that? Um, when yeah, is the so website? Going? Uh, sorry, that's going to be next Monday the seventh. Um, there's I don't have a specific time. It's uh, there's some IT administrator who's going to click a button when they come into work that day. So usually it's you know before nine o'clock, um, but. Uh, yeah, so, you know, something that you can do if, uh, if anyone's concerned about kind of the formatting of it, when that opens on Monday, you know, you still have over a week to actually submit. So what you can do is you can click on it, don't type any information in, but you can just sort of peruse the, um, the actual submission page just to get a sense of how that's going to look for submitting your pieces. But if you go to the Studio Art Portfolio page now, you can see, um, you know, what type of files, how they want them labeled, all of those details are listed out there. Okay, um, Rowan's asking, if we are graduating this semester but need to pass the portfolio review, are there any other steps that need to be taken after passing the review? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it, it all depends on the situation. Usually that's if you're doing the minor. Sometimes they wait until the last semester. Um, follow up with advising. We'll let you know um, kind of how that's going to work. So I would say just after going through the portfolio review, we can chat with you about that. Um, Valeria is asking, can all of my drawing pictures be from drawing to taken at UCF? Absolutely. So um, when we say that you're submitting five works, either from drawing one or drawing two, and two to three have to be figurative, um, we're not specific. Uh, you will have to submit something um, from drawing two, unless you were doing self-portraits in drawing one, which not everybody does. Um, so uh, you could include works that you created in drawing two that showcase your understanding of perspective from drawing one, um, that would be helpful. So not just your figurative work, not just your skeleton contours, not just your self portraits, not just the model, but show us that you understand vertical, diagonal and horizontal information, um, process lines, stuff like that. Um, Hannah's asking, can I submit personal work if I think it is stronger than the works I did in class? I just transferred and my projects are completely different. I when would, um, oh, to Verda, Ashley. I would think about what makes them stronger. So is it, do you like them more because they were personal works? Um, or are they stronger because they utilize a more effective composition? strategies is there a clear focal point is the color use is harmonious there's a demonstration of unity but then there's enough variety that makes it an interesting subject matter so i would think about what makes them interesting or what makes them successful excuse me i'll completely agree with ashley there be very careful of what you like we're not quite interested in what you like we want you to show the concepts so that we know that you are ready for the upper level courses. 
Uh, Lily's asking, I think I can grab this one. If we need to take intensive courses, would we need to submit a portfolio review again? It's an excellent question. So if, uh, again, in that example I had mentioned earlier, if let's say you don't pass drawing, uh, in a future semester, you then take drawing intensive. You must pass that intensive course with a grade of C or better. In doing so, you are not required to resubmit. That in and of itself will count as having passed the studio art portfolio. And once again, for good measure, taking the intensives is not a replacement for submitting. So at some point, you do have to submit. Um, but if you then take those intensives, then that will meet that requirement. Um, our and then we have from Angela, can I include figure drawing for the drawing portion? If you just want to confirm. Yes, so two to three of the works must be figurative, meaning either a self-portrait, skeleton contour, or a drawing of the model. Um, it, uh, that is a requirement. If we don't see any figurative work, we have no way of knowing if you're ready to take intermediate drawing, which is an anatomy course. Um, we have a couple more chat questions popping in, but we have someone with their hand raised. I don't know if that person wants to, I think they want to use their microphone. Nemesis? Oh, yes, sorry. I just prefer to talk. <laughs> sure. So I'm a first-gen future transfer student. I'll be ending my course on my current college by August because I'm taking the summer term. So right now I'm still enrolled on my drawing two class and I still need to take my art history two class during summer. So my question is right now, I'm not eligible, eligible to apply for this particular art portfolio or do I need to wait for the following? Right, so um, at this time, you would not be eligible to submit the studio art portfolio in spring of 2022, just based on the information that you're providing us. Um, so uh, something that's helpful to, to understand, um, because uh, students sometimes get this confused, you don't have to submit a portfolio before you would transfer to UCF. So it is perfectly acceptable, and in your case, it sounds like it's going to be necessary to apply for transfer for the fall semester. Um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully in the fall semester, you would be eligible to submit. But at that point, we'll be able to assist you and make sure that you're ready at that time. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a couple more questions. <laughs> okay. So, um, for in my case, basically, because I started my first two classes of drawing one and design one during COVID. So I don't have, I just have one figurative drawing that is my self portrait, but I don't have any other one. So I don't know if I should if I ask my professor to give me, because right now we're doing in-person classes. So is it okay, if it's okay, if I ask my professor to give me like an extra course so I can have that other figure trip drawing? Because I think for the rest of the semester, we're just doing still life. Um, as long as the work that you submit uh, is going to show the concepts, uh, will accept it but if you only have one figurative work right now and you need to play catch up real quick um and then and you probably are only going to be able to apply in fall if i was in your situation i would just take drawing one and two at ucf if you don't feel like you have enough figurative work or experience making figurative work um, we have a very competitive figurative work um uh program, right? So uh, I, I would take the opportunity um, to take advantage of this program. Okay. And I think that's it because the other question that I have already, is, it was already answered on the first question. So thank you very much. Not a problem. Um, Valeria, I was going to address your chat question, but did you wanna jump in, Mike? Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, so for the 2D design, so I took 2D design at a different school and the way it was set up that every project was like specific to each fundamental. So um, 
Can I submit more photos, more examples? Um, because I don't think any of my projects showcase all or a lot of the fundamentals just because they were split up weekly um, for each project. So unfortunately we have to keep it to three, but keep in mind though, that you don't have to demonstrate all the um, elements, but you should be demonstrating the principles of how those elements engage. So say for the first, you probably had a line project, right? So right. In, that, in that line project, you should be demonstrating compositional strategies, unity okay. and variety. Um, okay. There should be, a, maybe even value should be in that one, right? So that's okay, right? So. I, I strongly recommend if you had line, shape, um, value, texture, color, that you do, you know, you definitely have a color one, always have a color one, but then you can decide which ones are the strongest ones between your line, your shape, um, and uh, texture. Does that make okay. sense? It does make sense. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ingrid asks, in my drawing courses, we weren't really told to use lines or boxes that I saw in the examples to draw our pieces. Will that count against my works if I don't have perspective lines? You do need to show that you understand perspective. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a box per se. It could be furniture. It could be um, people standing in a room. It could be space, open space. It could be a landscape. Um, but if the, if the facts, the unbudgeable facts of perspective of Western perspective are not being shown, we will not pass you. Um, Ariana is asking, are there separate courses for 2D and 3D design intensive? Uh, no, we just have one course that is design intensive. My understanding is that uh, sometimes faculty approach it differently. Did you want to address that, Ashley? Uh, sure, yeah. Sometimes um, the goal, though, in that design intensive is to focus on 2D and 3D, but some faculty do uh, approach it slightly differently. Um, but yeah, there's not a separate class. Um, Paula asks, I'm a transfer student when submitting transcripts, do we need to send them at the moment of the application or before we start the application? So really the, um, this is just an unofficial transcript. It's not like part of your official application to UCF. The purpose of providing the transcript is so we can verify that you've met the appropriate prerequisites. So um, when you submit the application, there's going to be a little attachment option. If you can just attach that as like a PDF or something, that would be awesome. That way, like I said, we can just verify, you know, wherever you're coming from most schools we already have um, some equivalencies set up if you're in the state of Florida if anything we may end up following up with you uh, to ask additional questions about um, meeting those prerequisites but providing that transcript is that first step um, and then Lily asks are intensive courses available during the summer typically yes um, however, we have limited sections. So the, um, the actual, this is helpful for everybody, the schedule is going to be published coincidentally next Monday uh, for summer, fall, and spring of next year. So at this time, the schedule has not been officially published uh, for um, those upcoming semesters. But as of Monday, you'll be able to verify on there for sure how many sections of those are available. So potentially you could complete um, any necessary intensives in the summer. Um, you know, assuming those are offered. Um, that is everything we have at this point. I know we're a little bit over what we had initially projected, but does anyone else want to jump in with uh, any additional questions? Okay, well, it seems like we we may be um, caught up at this point. I can say just as a closing remark from advising, um, uh, you know, please do follow up with us. If you have any questions about classes moving forward, our schedule is starting to fill up really quickly, but we are offering in-person and uh, phone advising appointments. So please reach out. Um, 
and then yeah, Teresa was able to address that. Did you guys have any anything else that you wanted to close with? I want to also jump in as, as well. If you just had a quick question to, for us to verify if you're eligible to submit the portfolio, you can send us a quick email and we can look at your record. And the same thing goes with as a transfer. You can attach an unofficial transcript and we can verify if you met the requirements for the prereqs to, to be able to submit portfolio. But remember, it does opens this Monday. Um, so it's important that you guys keep an eye on the dates and when it closes. Okay. Any uh, anything else from our faculty you guys want to share with the students? Um, no, thank you all for being here today. Uh, if you do have questions, I put my email in the chat. It was listed before. Uh, my office hours are 12 to 1 p.m. Tuesday through Thursday or by appointment. So feel free to reach out. Okay. I'll include that as well. So my office hours are via Zoom on Friday starting at 8 a.m. ending around 11, I believe. Um, and, but it is better, especially if we're going to be talking about physical work, if you want to catch me in, I'm usually in the drawing office. Uh, so I'm either going to be in 210 or 212 upstairs. I teach from, I usually get to campus at around 1030 and I don't leave until 815 at night. So I will be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you will catch me in either 210, 212, or the drawing office in between. Um, and I just reposted all of the contact information that we had listed in the slides earlier. So definitely, um, if anyone thinks they need to follow up with any resource, please take uh, that information down. We're all happy to assist, but you got to make sure that you're reaching out in a timely manner. Um, like I said, once we hit that deadline, uh, that's going to be it for, for the semester. But thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And uh, good luck this semester. Thank you, Thank you everyone.